Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my history series where today I want to talk to you about a very special snail that will go on to change the world forever in a way that you probably wouldn't expect. This became a landmark legal case in the development of the law of negligence. It set a precedent that we still feel the effects of today, that manufacturers owe a duty of care to their consumers. It's the reason why when we purchase something today, whether that be food or a book or garden tools, we can be pretty confident that it is safe for human use. I say this case is about a snail and it is, but that's more of a hook to just grab your attention. Did it work? This case actually begins with a woman called Mrs. May Donahue, and to this day, Donahue versus Stevenson is the key precedent in negligence and duty of care disputes. It sounds boring, I promise you it's not. May Donahue was born May McAllister on the 4th of July, 1898 in Camberslang, a town on the outskirts of Glasgow in Scotland. The 1901 census shows her as being the second youngest child to James and Mary McAllister. She had two brothers and four sisters. When she was just 17 years old, she married Henry Donoghue and just seven months later, she gave birth to their son, also named Henry. It certainly seems like this was a rushed marriage because she had fallen pregnant out of wedlock. And back then, if you fell pregnant, you were pretty much obligated to marry to save being judged by society. Although I'm sure that judgment came anyway. Over the next few years, May would fall pregnant three more times but all the babies were premature and would die soon after birth. Although undeniably a very painful experience, this was a common occurrence in the early 20th century, especially for poorer women like May. The babies often died as a result of malnutrition and just a lack of medical care. May and Henry definitely gave the marriage their best shot it seems, but in 1928, after 12 years together, they separated and went their own ways, with May going to live with her brother John at 49 Kent Street in Glasgow. This is where she was living on Sunday the 26th of August 1928, when the wills would be set in motion that would eventually change the whole world. It seems like at this point in time, May was working as a shop assistant and on the day in question, she had a day off. So that evening, she decided to go and meet a friend for ice cream at Tally Cafe in Well Meadow Place in Paisley. Around 8.50 p.m., the friend, who I don't think was ever actually named, ordered for both of them. She ordered a pear and ice for herself and a ginger beer float for May, which they both consumed whilst chatting away. May's ginger beer float consisted of a glass of ice cream over which she would pour ginger beer, which was bought over in a separate bottle. Now, it's probably important to note that in Scotland at this time, maybe even still today, Scottish people let me know, a lot of the time, just all fizzy drinks are referred to, were referred to as ginger beer. So we don't actually know for certain if Mary really did have ginger beer that day or just a fizzy drink, a soda of any other description. They're all called ginger beer. As May finished off her drink, pouring the remaining liquid out of the ginger beer bottle into her glass, the decomposed remains of a snail fell out. Even the thought of that is enough to make me want to gag, knowing that you've already drunk the majority of the drink and this is what you're left with. There does seem to be a bit of confusion in this case as to whether the remains in question were that of a snail or a slug, because whilst referring to the case overall as the snail in the bottle, most articles will still say the remains were that of a slug. But in the official legal transcripts of this case, the creature is referred to as being a snail. In that moment, May was immediately upset. She was disgusted seeing these remains in her glass, as I think anyone would be. You see, the problem was that the glass in which the ginger beer had been was not transparent as you would generally expect today. I mean, even brown and green bottles today are still translucent. You can still see the liquid inside. But the bottle in question here was a brown glass bottle that was completely opaque. May had no way of knowing when she looked at it that there was a snail decomposing inside. Soon, May would fall ill, complaining of abdominal pain, which by the 29th of August, so just three days later, meant she had to go and consult a doctor. After that point, she still didn't get any better, and on the 16th of September, she was admitted to the Glasgow Royal Infirmary for emergency treatment, where she was diagnosed with severe gastroenteritis and shock. 
It certainly seems like May felt quite ill from this snail, and being a working class single mother, the time she would have had to have take off likely would have had an effect on her quality of life as a whole. And something important to know about May Donoghue was that she wasn't a woman who was about to accept no for an answer. She wasn't about to accept poor treatment and let somebody get away with it. She knew that someone was to blame for what happened to her and that that was negligence. There never should have been any animal, any snail in that bottle. Someone dropped the ball and she was going to get justice. I mean, gastroenteritis can be really rough. You're dealing with sickness, diarrhea, fever, dehydration. It really can put you out of action for quite a while. And May was quite ill with this for a number of weeks. I mean, bear in mind as well, this was 1928. Gastroenteritis back then would be a lot more life-threatening than it would be now with today's medical care. What Mary couldn't have known in this time was that in the lead up to the snail in her ginger beer, a local lawyer called Walter Leachman had actually been fighting two very similar legal cases in which mice had been found in bottles under very similar circumstances. Separately, two children called John and Francis Mullen and a woman called Jeannie Aurobine had come across dead mice in their bottles of ginger beer and they claimed to have become ill through drinking the drinks. Remember what I said, ginger beer doesn't just mean ginger beer, it could have been any fizzy drink. So these cases were heard in two separate hearings and although information around this on the internet is quite confusing, I think Jeannie was successful in claiming compensation whilst the Mullen children were not. The losing parties of both cases appealed to the court of sessions where the claimants argued that although there was no direct evidence that the manufacturers of the bottles had been negligent, the negligence could have been presumed because of the sheer fact that dead mice were found in those bottles. However, the court still ruled against them because as the law stood at the time, one, product manufacturers only owed a duty of care to the consumers if there was a contractual relationship between the parties, two, if the dangerousness of the product was intentionally withheld from the consumer, or three, if there was no warning of the intrinsic dangerousness of a certain product. Basically, as long as the product being manufactured wasn't intrinsically dangerous, like explosives for example, and the manufacturer didn't intentionally misrepresent the level of danger, there could be no evidence of negligence found. Manufacturers had no responsibility to ensure that the product was free of mice or snails or slugs. Should they have had that responsibility? Well, yeah, that's what this entire case was about. But as the law stood at the time, they simply didn't have to care. Mass production of products was a relatively new thing and the law simply hadn't caught up. Well, there's a bit of mystery as to how exactly May Donoghue ended up at the door of Walter Leachman, with him only three weeks out of fighting the mice cases. Some think it was pure coincidence, a wonderful moment of kismet. Some people think that May may have heard about the mice and sought him out on purpose. We don't know, maybe he found her. But it seems that Leachman very well may have been the only lawyer, not just in Glasgow, but in the whole of the UK, maybe in the whole world, who would have been willing to take May's case on in that moment. I mean, she was a single mother, separated from her husband, a lowly shop assistant at this time. She didn't have the funds to be able to pay him. Most would have just brushed her off. But Leachman didn't. He saw the value in her case and knew that this negligence law was something that needed addressing in the highest of courts. So he took May's case on, with her wishing to claim against Frances Mangella, who was the owner of the cafe, and David Stevenson, the manufacturer of the ginger beer. Stevenson ran a company producing both ginger beer and lemonade in Paisley, so less than a mile from the Wellmeadow Cafe. May's friend had taken note of the contact details for the manufacturer on the bottle at the time of the incident. They knew exactly where this bottle came from. The case against Francis Mangella, the cafe owner, got thrown out pretty quickly. It was agreed very early on in the proceedings that Mangella had sold the ginger beer in good faith and he could have had no idea that the drink was substandard. Also, seeing as May's friend had been the one to order the ginger beer, it was her with whom Mingella had a contract and not May. Had the friend been the one to drink the drink and then open proceedings against him, then she may well have had a leg to stand on. But there was no contract between May and Mingella. There was nothing that could be done there. In the end, May was actually ordered to pay the cost Mingella had incurred in defending himself. 
With David Stevenson, however, the manufacturer, it wasn't quite as straightforward. May sued him for £500 of damages and costs, claiming that he'd breached his duty of care owed to her as a consumer of his product. The official argument, as per the National Records of Scotland, read, The shock and illness suffered by the pursuer, May, were due to the fault of the defender, Stevenson. The said ginger beer was manufactured by the defender and his servants to be sold as an article to drink to members of the public. It was accordingly the duty of the defender to exercise the greatest care in order that snails would not get into the said bottle, render the said ginger beer dangerous and harmful and be sold with the said ginger beer. Further, it was the duty of the defender to provide a system of working his business that was safe and would not allow snails to get into his ginger beer bottles, including the said bottle. Such a system is usual and customary and is necessary in the manufacture of a drink like ginger beer to be used for human consumption. In these duties, the defender culpably failed and pursuer's illness and shock were the direct result of his said failure in duty. Looking back on this case now, with 2023 hindsight and 2023 laws, it's pretty clear that May had a case here, that of course the duty of care fell on the manufacturer of the product. But this was 1928, this was before any laws around this existed. It really wasn't as simple as manufacturers should take care to ensure their products are safe for human consumption. Can manufacturers just put anything in their products and it be fine? At what point does the law step in here? At what point can it be deemed as dangerous? There was no culpability here, there was no duty of care. You really could, within reason, put anything in your bottles, anything in your products, and it was generally fine. But what I think is also important to bear in mind here is that the people making these laws, for the most part, were the middle class, the higher ups in society. People who ran companies, who had money thanks to industry, whose wealth were closely entwined with the manufacture of these products. They weren't the ones working in the factories, obviously, but they were closely tied to it, tied to industry. And of course, that's not in every case, but it is in a lot of cases. Middle class people, the wealthy, have their money for a reason. When it came to lawmakers, especially when cases like this reached the courts, it was generally, again, not always, but generally, in their best interest to ensure that manufacturers weren't liable because that was a whole can of worms or can of slugs for them. Just capitalism. It all stems back to capitalism. In the claim against Stevenson, he also argued that because May's friend had been the one to purchase and order the product, he again had no contract with May herself. And as she had no contract with anyone, she was going to have to prove negligence. When Walter Leachman issued May's writ against Stevenson, he described the Stevenson plant, where the ginger beer was bottled, as a place where snails and the slimy trails of snails were frequently found. I mean, this was Scotland, it rained constantly, it was, is a very wet place. Snails are rife. It was argued that Stevenson had a duty of care to the customer to ensure the snails did not get into his bottles and he had breached that duty by failing to provide a system to clean the bottles effectively. Something necessary given that ginger beer was always intended for human consumption. When Stevenson left the bottles in places where it was obvious that snails did have freedom of access, he was in a breach of duty. Stevenson responded to this allegation by obviously denying that his bottles contained snails and said that May had grossly exaggerated her injuries, saying any illness suffered by the claimant was due to the bad condition of her own health at the time. His four main arguments were that the claim had no legal basis, the facts could not be substantiated, he hadn't caused May any injury, and the claimed amount was excessive. He could not have reasonably foreseen, he said, that a snail would be found in one of his bottles. Stevenson's counsel also argued that even though there was no seal on the bottle, it still wasn't their responsibility, it was that of the cafe owner. But of course, the cafe owner had already been dismissed. Stevenson's counsel moved the court sessions to dismiss this claim in which they were successful, it was dismissed, and when May and Leachman appealed, they were unsuccessful. The judges here followed the decision they'd recently made in the mice and bottles cases, the majority declaring that the only difference between those cases was that one was a rodent and one was a gastropod, which in the law of Scotland amounted to no difference at all. 
They held that the manufacturer of a product owed no duty of care to an ultimate consumer unless the consumer had a contract with the manufacturer requiring such care, which would have been a very unlikely situation indeed. But May Donoghue, luckily, was not a woman who was easily disheartened. In February 1931, she filed a petition to appeal to the House of Lords all the way down in London. This was all, of course, a very long process, although the incident had happened in August 1928. We know the justice system takes its sweet time. It's now 1931. May's big problem now, though, was that she was incredibly poor. As I've already pointed out, she was a single mum, a shop assistant, she lived with her brother. She didn't have the money to provide security for costs in case she lost the appeal. Usually, the person filing the claim would have to pay the cost if it was ruled against them. Along with filing the petition with the House of Lords, she also sought permission to pursue the case in former pauperess, with the status of a pauper. She provided an affidavit in which she said, I am very poor and am not worth in all the world the sum of five pounds. My wearing apparel and the subject matter of the said appeal only accepted. She was given permission for this. She was officially a pauper and therefore she was not required to provide security for costs. She was essentially able to pursue this fight for free and she could keep fighting. Besides from the emotional and mental strain, there wasn't gonna be a financial strain. Her legal team, including Leachman, had already agreed to work pro bono, probably knowing that they were working on changing the core of the law. If they succeeded, this was gonna look fantastic for them. They didn't need May's money, they'd get loads of it after. This whole thing was pretty controversial for people, with lots of people to this very day believing that May never actually fell ill as a result of this snail, or doubting the snail's existence at all. Some say they think Leachman hired her off the back of his failed mice and bottles cases, but I suppose it doesn't really matter now. For the most part, the fight that May fought was for the greater good, especially looking back with 2023 hindsight. In 1983, Leachman's son came forward and said that his father was a meticulous solicitor with very strong morals. He would not have taken the case without interviewing both May Donoghue and her friend closely, until he was satisfied that they were telling the truth. It's generally thought today that what happened in Wellmeadow Cafe that day has never been proven. No one knows for sure that this snail existed. But you've got to trust that it did. And maybe if it was a hoax, not that I really think it was, but maybe if it was, it was indeed for the greater good. Nine months after the petition was filed, the appeal was heard across two days, on the 10th and 11th of December 1931, in the committee room of the House of Lords, all the way down in London. Five lords sat to hear the arguments in May's case, including a man called Lord James Richard Atkin. He was said to have a very acute mind. He was incredibly clever and industrious. He was known by his peers for always reading the papers very closely beforehand, paying close attention. He did his due diligence. He was a man of morals. And then after the hearing, May then had to wait five whole months for a judgment, where by a majority of three to two, it was agreed that she did indeed have a case. They ruled that she was owed a duty of care by the manufacturer and the bottler of the ginger beer, and that she could bring action against him. This duty of care was founded on what is called the neighbour principle, after Lord Atkin had been spending a lot of time studying the idea of the Good Samaritans. Not long before he heard May's case, he'd given a lecture at King's College in London, in which he'd said, the British has always necessarily ingrained in it moral teachings in the sense that it lays down standards of honesty of plain dealing between man and men. He has not injured his neighbour by acts of negligence, and that certainly covers a very large field of the law. Atkin couldn't ignore that he'd said this when it came to May's case. On the 26th of May, 1932, Lord Atkin made a now famous speech, or at least very famous in lawyer circles, summarizing his neighbor principle as follows. The rule that you are to love your neighbor becomes in law, you must not injure your neighbor. And the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor, receives a restricted reply. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbor. Who then, in law, is my neighbour? The answer seems to be, 
Persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. The lawyer's question he refers to in this portion of the speech is the one asked of Jesus in Luke's gospel in the Bible, I assume, which prompted Jesus to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. Yes, there is no separation of church and state in England, which I have a lot of thoughts about anyway, but there's a whole video for another time. In spirit, May was Stevenson's neighbour. In manufacturing his product, he should have taken reasonable care to ensure that someone wasn't injured. Neighbour is defined as someone who might be affected directly by your actions, not necessarily your geographical neighbour. As May had no reasonable way of examining the opaque glass bottle herself that day to ensure there wasn't a snail inside, it's reasonable to expect the manufacturer should have done so. However, by this point, David Stevenson had died. With May having finally won her case, executors agreed on an out-of-court settlement of £200, which is equal to a little over £11,000 today. I mean, before this, she'd signed an affidavit saying she wasn't even worth £5. This was a huge amount of money for a woman like May, even though it wasn't the full £500 she originally wanted. In making this one statement about the neighbour principle, Lord Atkins set out the foundation for the common law of negligence within the UK and eventually worldwide. It's widely regarded as one of the most important cases in the history of the common law, the case establishing several key legal principles, including the duty of care owed by manufacturers to their consumers, the principle of neighbourhood and the principle of strict liability. The image of this snail in the bottle has become a cultural shorthand for the idea that consumers have a right to expect that the products they purchase will be safe for them and free from harm. The Donahue snail in the bottle case today is the reason when manufacturers must take care that computers don't overheat and set on fire, why your gas cooker doesn't explode, why cars must safely get you from point A to point B. Every single day, this precedent makes our life safer without even thinking about it. In 1932, they were at the point where mass production was really starting to take hold and the law simply hadn't caught up. Any negligence case today, any duty of care case has made on Hugh and Lord Atkin at the centre and not just in the UK either. An article on scotsman.com spoke to a law professor from the University of New Brunswick called John Kleefeld. He's found nearly 3,000 cases from 36 different countries citing this case. There's the UK, obviously, but also Australia, Canada, Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, the Pacific Islands, and more. Over the last 90 years, the principle has been stretched into so many other rulings. Of course, whilst this landmark decision did set forth the idea that you must be cautious not to injure or hurt people, it has raised many questions over the years as to where this liability ends. I mean, businesses at one point started arguing that competitor companies making similar products would be causing them injury or monetary loss. And surely that's not allowed under the neighbour principle. It literally says, use reasonable care in all your activities as to not injure a neighbour. You're injuring a neighbour's business by taking money from them, right? Like, that counts. I mean, the only way to make money is to take it from other people. The idea bled into the sort of economic area and it started to become very murky, as always happens when money is involved. That kind of thing can only be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, but people really did take this sort of idea, the neighbour principle, and they ran with it. But the question of where does the liability end is a valid one. I mean, say I bought a book and I got a paper cut from the pages of said book. Could I sue the publisher or the manufacturer for causing that paper cut? What if it got infected? What if I lost my finger? Or is it my own responsibility to ensure that I don't cut myself? Has the manufacturer made steps to ensure that I'm less likely to cut myself? These are the kinds of questions that are explored in courts worldwide because yes, people do sue for things like that. But the ruling at the time did say, the burden of proof must always be upon the injured party to establish that the defect which caused the injury was present in the article when it left the hands of the party whom he sues, that the defect was occasioned by the carelessness of that party. 
So you, as the injured person, do have to prove that it was this item that caused your injury. That burden is still on you. So every time you turn on your oven and don't die, every time you get in your car and make it safely from point A to point B within reason, when you turn on your lawnmower and the blades don't remove a finger, when you drink from a glass bottle and there's no snail to be found, you can probably thank May Donahue for her tenacity, her willingness to fight this all the way to the House of Lords, even though she barely had a penny to her name. It's crazy now to think of a world in which manufacturers didn't have to ensure their products were safe for use or consumption, but that was the world in which May Donahue lived and that was the world that she changed. Was she ever fully aware of the difference she made around the world? I don't really know. She sadly died in March 1958, at which time she was actually known by her mother's name, Mabel Hannah. Her only son, Henry, had three boys and four girls, and one of the only photos of her shows her holding her twin daughters, Elizabeth and May, with a very proud look on her face. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I really hope you feel like you've learned something. If you're listening to this, watching this on YouTube, then please make sure you give this a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. Comments are the number one most helpful thing to push a video out into the YouTube algorithm. So you have no idea how much your comments help. If you're listening to this on my podcast, then please maybe give the podcast a rating, give it a thumbs up. It really helps me out. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.